Welcome back everyone. This is Professor Herring. In this video we're going to start learning about liquids. We're going to talk about the different phase transitions and energies associated with those transitions. We're going to learn about specific heat and molar heat capacity. And then learn about heating and cooling curves and use those to calculate the energy required to do different phase transitions. Let's begin. So let's first talk about liquids. What's a liquid? It's something that takes the shape of the container while maintaining a constant volume. Therefore, as you can see, cats are liquids. Pause for the hilarious laughter. All right, enough nerdy chemistry jokes. Let's get into this. We're going to start and see if you read which of the processes here would release the most heat. Pause the video and try this on your own before proceeding. Welcome back. So what, I, what you might want to do here is start by identifying what type of process each of these is. From liquid to solid, that's freezing. Gas to liquid, that's condensation. Solid to gas, that's sublimation. Gas to solid, that's deposition. Liquid to gas, that's vaporization. And an extra lecture point if you can recognize which process is missing. Any takers? Any takers? Well, we've got solid to gas and liquid to gas, but no solid to liquid, which is melting. All right, so let's take a look at this. When we go from low energy state, like a solid, to higher energy states, like liquid and gas, that requires an input of energy. So the process is going from low to high, melting, also called fusion, vaporization, and sublimation. Those require energy. That's an input. That's endothermic. Whereas the other three, deposition, condensation, and freezing, give off energy. So when wanting to know which one's going to release the most heat, we look for the largest change in energy. And from going from a gas to a solid is going to give off the most heat because it goes from the highest energy state to the lowest energy state. This is just summarizing what we saw on the previous page. And let's talk now about why this is the case. Why does it require energy, first of all, to go from low to high energy, to go from solid to liquid to gas, but then also, why is there a difference in energy? Why is it proportional to go from solid to liquid is less than from liquid to gas? And the answer is yes. That is true. That's, that's always the case. And the reason is, is because what we're doing is we're disrupting intermolecular forces. Remember when we took a look and we saw that a solid was clumped like this, liquids filled the, their container, Gases occupy the entire volume of the container, and they change depending on the size of the container. Gases are very high energy, high kinetic energy, relative to liquids, and which are higher relative to solids. And what we're doing is to go from one to the next is we need to break the intermolecular forces. Well, to go from solid to liquid, this is going to break some IMFs but there are still IMFs present. However, when we go from to gas phase, we're going to break all remaining IMFs. Let's try that again. All remaining intermolecular forces. And therefore, since we're breaking all of the remaining intermolecular forces, that's going to require the, a much larger input of energy. So, let's have you try another question. Which of the following substances would we expect to have the largest enthalpy of vaporization? Pause the video and try this on your own. Welcome back. So, enthalpy of vaporization describes the heat that we need to vaporize a substance. Or in other words, go from liquid to gas. During vaporization, we're going to break intermolecular forces. 
And the stronger the intermolecular forces, the more heat that is required to break them. In other words, a higher enthalpy of vaporization. So when we consider the, which intermolecular forces are present, remember we first look for differences in hydrogen bond, then we look for differences in molar mass, looking ideally for something that's larger than 10 grams per mole different. Then we look at differences in polarity, assuming that the first two are the same, and assuming that all three of those are the same, then we look at shape and size. So, hydrogen bonding. This one can do hydrogen bonding. The others can now, cannot have hydrogen bonding. All right, well now let's, so we know this one is the highest then enthalpy of vaporization. But what about the other two? For kicks and giggles, let's try this out. Butane is going to be a C4H10. And acetone is C3H, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, O. So when you look at the molar masses of these, this is going to be about 58. And this is going to be 36 plus 6 is 42 plus 16. Oh, also 58. Okay. So they're the same in terms of molar mass. But acetone is much more polar. And therefore, it's going to be in the middle. So if we look at the boiling points, then it actually corroborates what we just said here. Isopropyl alcohol has the highest boiling point, butane has the lowest. And that means that, that the enthalpies of vaporization are going to follow the same trend. Take a moment to look over this graph and try and understand what it's communicating. Welcome back. So hopefully what you see is that the processes are summative. They're additive. In other words, sublimation is going from solid to gas. And if we look at the energy to go from solid to liquid and then liquid to gas, and sorry, this is not to scale right here, that these two equals that. They're the same. So, and that makes sense when we remember that what we're doing is we're just breaking the intermolecular forces. Going from solid to liquid breaks some, going from liquid to gas breaks the rest. Or if we just break them all from the start, then that's sublimation. And these values are named after the endothermic process. So sublimation, fusion, and vaporization. The reverse process is going to be the negative of those values. And in all cases, it's the heat that's needed to do the process for one mole of substance. Now we can talk about something that's called the heat capacity. And this is the heat required to raise the temperature by one degree, Kelvin or Celsius. Um, and so the difference between the enthalpy change for the heat of fusion or vaporization is that that's going to um, cause a physical change, whereas here we're just talking about changing the temperature. And so we have the specific heat capacity, which is the heat capacity per gram. This can be related as the heat transferred per mass per degree changed. And the heat capacity is different for each phase. So a solid generally requires more energy to heat than a liquid. Um, or excuse me, a, a sol excuse me, solids are generally are le require less energy to heat than liquids. And gases are even less than that. We can see this here when we look at water. And the reason for those differences really comes to the types of intermolecular forces that exist between them. Then we have the molar heat capacity. And the molar heat capacity is, you can see, very similar. It's the heat transferred, but instead of per gram, it's per mole. And we can have some standardized values here for the water, for water as well. And when you're solving problems, you want to pay attention to the units. There's only a slight difference in the units 
it's either going to be in gram, energy per gram Kelvin or energy per mole Kelvin. Sometimes you might see that this is degrees Celsius instead of Kelvin, but it's all the same. Kelvin and Celsius is going to be the same scale as we've talked about already. So let's take a look at some heat capacities for different substances. What we see is that substance, some substances have much higher heat capacities. Water has very high heat capacity. Uh, that means that it takes lots of heat to change the temperature of water. That makes water a good um, insulator relative to things like aluminum and copper. Those transfer a lot of heat and therefore they heat up and cool off very quickly. Calorimetry is the study of heat flow. And we use calorimetry to measure energy changes, in other words, heat transfer, when we do physical and chemical processes. We can, uh, when we're talking about temperature changes, we use the relationships that we discussed when, when discussing uh, specific heats or molar heat capacities. And Q is the amount of heat that's given off or absorbed as the temperature changes. The sign of the temperature is going to determine the sign of the heat because the heat capacities and the masses or moles are always going to be positive. Depending on the change in temperature, that's going to dictate whether or not your heat is given off or absorbed. And as I already alluded to, one degree Kelvin is the same thing as one degree Celsius. Now, you might say, Professor Herring, how can this be? In order to convert between Celsius and Kelvin, you have to account for 273.15 degrees. How in the world can they be the same? Well, let's take a look. Let's go from 10 degrees to 5 degrees Celsius. That different, or 5 degrees to 10 degrees, is a difference of plus 5 degrees. Right? 5 degrees Celsius to 10 degrees Celsius, 5 degrees. Now, let's see, what is that difference in Kelvin? You add 273.15 to both of those values, and you get a difference of 5 Kelvin. Okay? So it turns out that 1 degree Celsius is the same as 1 degree Kelvin. However, a common error, common error alert here, is where they take the change in temperature and add 273.15. So in other words, they say, oh, look, let's do 5 degrees Celsius, which is the change, and then add 273.15 and say, oh, look, the temperature changed by 278.15 degrees Kelvin. And this is false. Don't ever do this. Please, 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 please. All right, let's try a problem here. I'm going to give you an example. So uh, liquid nitrogen is an awesome compound. Uh, when I was doing research in the lab, uh, I actually got to take and uh, pour liquid nitrogen on a big, huge vat of soap suds, and it froze them over, and it was really cool. Uh, they didn't let me do that after that. So if we take and pour liquid nitrogen over a bowl of marshmallows, we can actually freeze them. And then if you put the marshmallow in your mouth, it's going to... Um, go from really, really cold to the temperature of your body, which is about 37 degrees Celsius. So we want to know, if you put one marshmallow in your mouth after freezing it with liquid nitrogen, how much energy does that involve? And is that going to be energy given off or absorbed? All right, how do we want to think about this? Well, first of all, remember that um, the ener if, if we're talking about we need to look at systems and surroundings. So what's our system? Well, it's going to be the marshmallow because that's what we care about. Okay? And since the marshmallow is being put, it's cold and it's being put in a hot environment, it's going to absorb energy. Okay? So we know then this is going to be an endothermic process. Now, how endothermic, you ask? Let's find out. To do this, we need to account for the change in temperature, the mass, and the specific heat of the substance. So the change in temperature is found by 
taking the final minus the initial, which is 37 degrees minus a negative 196 for a total change of 233 degrees Celsius. We then take and multiply the specific heat times the mass and the change in temperature, and we get this is equal to about 233 joules. Accounting for significant figures, this becomes 230 joules. All right, let's talk now about not just temperature changes, but also phase changes. If we want to take a mole of ice from negative 40 degrees Celsius to 130 degrees Celsius, this is what we might do. This is what we call a heating curve or a heat, sometimes you'll hear heat curve. I call it though a heating curve. It's, it's not curvy, but it is a type of a curve, okay, in the traditional mathematical sense. And so what we do is we can depict the temperature change as a function of the heat added. And as we add in heat, we see that going from solid, as we, as we take the solid, we first increase its temperature, we then melt the solid, which requires no temperature change, because all we're doing is, at that point, breaking the intermolecular forces. We then heat up, increase the kinetic energy of the liquid. We then vaporize, which breaks the, all the remaining intermolecular forces. And then we increase the temperature of the gas to our final temperature. And so what we see here is that when we heat, when we heat a substance, we can um, add heat in two different ways, to either change the temperature or to change the phase. And it's important to note, as is shown in the, in the heat cur heating curve, um, that the temperature does not change during a phase change. So to reiterate, when we add heat, we can have two types of changes. Within a single phase, solid, liquid, or gas, we can change the temperature. And that's because we're um, increasing the molecular motion and the kinetic energy the molecular attractions and the order is going to decrease. We become more disordered. During a phase transition, however, temperature is constant and the average kinetic energy is staying the same, but the total energy increases. This means that the molecular attractions and the order is also going to decrease. So let me show you um, a sample. Let me walk you through this process. So to solve this type of a problem, you're going to need to know a bunch of constants. And when I say no, I mean you need to know how to look them up or use them if they're given to you. Um, I recommend that you start by drawing the heat curve. And so what you want to do is you want to plot the given points. Something um, that it is expected that you know. You must know. the melting and boiling temperature of water at one atmosphere. In other words, the normal melting point and boiling point. It is assumed that you know them because you're a human and it is just a, sign, a, a good literacy idea. Okay, so that, uh, in case you don't know them, that's zero degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, so what we do then is we increase the temperature, temperature from negative 40 to zero. We then melt. We then increase from zero to 100. We then vaporize and increase from 100 to 130. Don't worry about the slopes. Um, the slopes of these three processes are related to the specific heats or the heat capacity. And then the, uh, the distances here 
relate to the enthalpies. I've indicated some lines here to kind of break this up into given parts, and we see that we have one, two, three, four, five different heats, different processes, okay? We're increasing the temperature three times, and we're causing phase changes two times. So the way that this would happen is we can break this up into its five parts, and then we can indicate uh, which equations we're going to use. Anytime it's a temperature change, we use Q equals MC delta T, or N, depending on if it's mass or moles. We, since we have one mole of ice, we're going to use the molar, molar heats. You take the, the, specific, the molar heat capacity times the number of moles and the temperature change, you get the value. For the melting process, it's going to be um, the moles times the enthalpy of fusion. Again, find the appropriate values and plug those in. We can repeat this process across the board. And it's really just the same thing done over and over. The key ideas are draw your diagram. Draw your heating curve. Identify your transitions. Identify the heat equations that you're going to use plug in your values, and please, for Pete's sake, use your units. So many times students make errors on these, and they don't know what they're doing wrong, and they make mistakes, and they can't figure it out, and guess what? We can't help if you don't have your units. So please use your units. All right, I'm off of my soapbox. So we plug these, the rest of these in, and it's the process just repeated over and over and over. And the big idea at the end is that the sum of all the heats is just the sum of all the heats. Okay? All right. That's that. That's the end of the lecture. There is an extra practice problem for you to do. You are welcome to try this. So if you're going to do that, pause the video and try it out on your own before watching me do the solution. And if you don't want to watch it, then that's it for this video, and see you later. Welcome back. So now we're freezing cucumber sticks with liquid nitrogen. We then put it in our mouth. Yikes! And we want to know, how much energy does it take? Assume that it's 100% water. Okay. Again, start out by drawing your, heat cur your heating curve. Indicate your temperatures that are relevant. Uh, draw your lines. We know we're going from negative 196 to 37, and so we're going to have to transition at the melting point of water, which is 0 degrees Celsius, and then we're going to increase. So we have a total of three phases, or three steps, Q1, Q2, Q3. Okay. Remember, we're paying attention to our units here, um, and we're keeping ourselves organized. So. We need to know um, the heat for the first step, but we don't know the number of moles. We're given the molar heat capacities, so we need to find the moles. If we have 5 grams and we assume it's 100% water, we can find the number of moles. We then plug that in with the molar heat capacity, the number of moles, the change in temperature, and we get the energy involved. The melting process is going to, going to require that we use the enthalpy of fusion. We've already found the number of moles, and so we can solve for that. And then we go from 0 to 37 degrees Celsius, making sure that we're using MC delta, NC delta T. We use the correct specific heat, or the molar heat capacity, with the number of moles and the change in temperature. That would get us then our energy in joules. We need to convert to kilojoules to add them up. When, to add them up, we just take each of the three values, add them together to get 4.49 kilojoules. 
Okay, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have questions, ask on Piazza and office hours or recitation. See you later.